What is up, my friends? Welcome to Rebel and Create's Fatherhood Field Notes podcast, where I interview incredible fathers, gaining wisdom from their stories for you and I to grow in our craft. I'm your guide, Ned Shout, father to five kiddos, currently ages 9 to 16, and husband to my rad wife, Sarah, working on her 18th year of marriage. So yep, I'm in the thick of it, the adventure of fatherhood, and I'm working daily to rebel against the low expectations for fathers and create a world where fathers know who they are as they show up for their families. You and I have the greatest opportunity to impact our world through the way we embrace our fatherhood role. I believe the role of the father is to serve, guide, provide, protect, and have fun in the messiness of it all. I'm super stoked for you to meet today's guest, E. Kaika Ho'o'uli. In this conversation, we talk about making a big move as a family. What does that look like, feel like? How do you go about it moving out of state? A lot of families are talking about this right now, so it's great to hear some perspective. And then we talk about career change. What does it look like to change careers and to take a chance on yourself? Enjoy meeting my friend, E. Kaika. All right, Ikaika, my friend, what is up? Welcome to Fatherhood Field Notes podcast. We've been talking about uh, talking fatherhood together for over a year, and here we are now in different states talking fatherhood. How are you, my friend? Yeah, I think we're two time zones away from each other now. Yep, it is earlier here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you're uh, four hours behind me because I'm mountain yep. time. And I am Hawaiian time, baby. I know, and I'm, my name's Ikaika, and I'm on Mountain Time. Go figure. Yeah, and I'm uh, Ned Wolfgang Shout, and um, with that middle name, I should be the one living in the mountains. <laughs> no, Hawaii is great, man. I actually, my wife and I will probably retire there when our kids are old and gone. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a good spot. A lot of retirees here, uh, but you know we're getting settled in. It's only been seven months. So let's jump into fatherhood. So uh, I want to ask you a couple questions, help people get an understanding of who I'm talking to here. How old do you find yourself today? I am 34, but my kids would tell you I'm 29. Oh yeah. Is that what you've told them to say or? Uh, yeah, no, no, I, no, it's like a running joke in my, it's a running joke in my house that I, uh, that I hate growing old because like I'm starting to go mm. bald and stuff. So it's like a running joke in my house that I, that I pretend like I'm 29. I really don't care. I'm 34. I'm 34 and happy. Um, actually if I was still as dumb as I was when I was 29, I, it would be a problem. But <laughs> had the whole world figured out at 29. No, my, my kids, uh, it's, it's a running joke, just especially because, uh, I act like a big kid. My wife says that she has four kids. So, <laughs> yeah, I think my wife feels that way, but clearly I know you and you show up for your family, but you still got to have fun and be silly. Oh, yeah. So you have three kids. What are their ages? I have a 15 year old, a 13 year old and an 11 year old. Okay. Boys, girls, uh, two girls and a boy. My boy's right in the middle. Smack dab in the middle. Mama's boy. Love it. And how many years you've been married? Uh, we have been married since, uh, that day, 2011. So we're on 10 years now. Nice, man. Congratulations. That's awesome. 10 years, three kids, and you just made a big move. Yeah. Yeah. Moved up to Idaho. We just, um, Honestly, we we kind of got together collectively as an as a group and said what's going to be best for our family in terms of our biggest thing was we want to be together as a family because that was the most important thing for us um in a state that gave us freedom to be able to do the things that we love and we're all outdoorsy my daughters love fishing you know I'm a pretty avid snowboarder I'm a uh, pretty avid bow hunter and so this the state just gave us the gave us the ability to do the things that we like. Yeah. Give you the backyard you want to play in. So when you say we got together as a group, are you talking you, your wife and your three kids, or are you talking like extended family all made this decision together? So, so, um, a little bit of background on my wife and I, so we are, we're, we're Christians and my wife was on staff at our, at our church back home. So as a group, which is in California, yeah, in California. And we started the, the conversation started with just my wife and I, then we seek counsel. So we seek, uh, members of the, like, of our, of our church, our board members and pastors mm -hmm. and everything. We, we seek their wisdom and everyone was kind of saying the same thing. They said, listen, you guys have been faithful. You guys have been faithful in, in what you guys have done at the church. And now it's one of those positions where it's not God leading you guys to Idaho. You guys have been faithful. And now he's giving you guys a choice. You choose between these two States and either way, as long as you continue to seek his, his kingdom and you can continue to do what you're doing here, 
either way, you guys are fine. And this is God telling you, I'm, this is my, my gift. You guys can choose what you want to do. So then we took a few trips up here, stayed at a couple Airbnbs. And then, um, uh, over, you know, the next couple of months after that, we said, yep, Idaho is a place. And then involved our kids in the decision making after that, after we had decided, yeah, this is it. As long as the kid, as long as we're going to get some resistance, I have a 15 year old, she's got a boyfriend. It's mm -hmm. a, a whole deal. The kids, they we've grown up there. Um, one of my daughters who's 11, and we've been, we had attended Destiny for almost a decade. So she didn't know anything else. The only thing she right. knew was, was that church home and that church family. So we said, if they are not going to be okay, we're not making this move. That's the only way that this move wouldn't happen is if they're not going to be okay. And there was some, some small resistance, but outside of that, there was, there wasn't a whole lot. And I think that we kind of prepared them for, for this move. Cause they, I think they knew that it was coming. Um, we had been talking about it for a long time. Um, us yeah, kids. it's a tough decision though, you know, and it's tough on, it's tough on the kids, you know, so we go back and forth cause we have a 15 year old as well and not super psyched on the move, not super psyched on the, the, the schools has made a couple changes. Um, you know, but what we've continued to come back to is, we're really providing them family, right? A home family and not everything. I can't, I cannot control everything that happens outside of this and the messiness that they're going to have to live through. Of course, there's this ideal of we grew up in the same small town for the whole time yeah. and you have all your best friends. And I love that idealistic, you know, movie. Um, but that's just not necessarily how life is. And it's, it's kind of how the world is at the moment too. There's a lot of shifts. And so when you are making that decision as a family versus the world dictating it for you. That's pretty cool place to be. Yeah. And, and I agree with you. And I think you're, I think you're, um, our kids went to the same school back in California because I think they went to Forest Lake, right? Or at least your daughter uh, did. for a minute. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. our kids went there for two years and that was hard to leave that school. I mean, we yeah, moved up here spot. When we moved up here to Idaho, the first thing we had to do was find a, a school that was like that. And one of the biggest things for us is we wanted a, like a biblical teaching. Mm -hmm. It's just having that a part of their school was important for us. And like, you know, we have a, our oldest who's, who has had her own, her own share of like trials. I mean, she's gone through some, some things in her, in her childhood. Um, and that's a part of her testimony now, but what's awesome is to see what God did through her after that. You know, she, she had gotten mm. in a little bit of trouble at school, which is why the Forest Lake move happened. And now she like does her own Bible study and her and her boyfriend do Bible mm. study on the phone because they're on, on FaceTime and she's doing a cover to cover reading right now of the Bible. And I'm like, man, I don't know that I've ever covered a cover read it. I mean, I've read it. I've read the whole thing in pieces. I've gone back and forth all over the place, but I don't know that I've ever sat down and, and cover to cover read that thing. So I've seen like that move in her. So it's been pretty cool. That's incredible. So a question I think a lot of dads have when they're going to make a big move, you know, and we got other questions to get into, but since we're sitting here, let's talk about it is okay. You're going to sell everything or you're going to move your stuff. Um, we got a lot of people moving around right now. Well, what do you do job wise? So what did you currently do? And then what's the transition you're making to still provide for the family? So what, what I did beforehand, I was a sales manager at a dealership at a, uh, dealership in Sacramento at made a Toyota sack. Um, and it was really, it was a really hard transition out here because I was completely changing fields. So now I'm at an MLO mortgage loan originator, sorry, a uh, mortgage loan originator. Got it. And, um, and starting up your own, you know, you start up your own, your own, um, you're starting up business for yourself. So we did, we sold everything. So then when you go ahead, mm-hmm. No, so I was just going to say, you know, you're, maybe you're getting into that, but you're, you sold everything. How do you position yourself? Like, okay, I got three months to make this work. I got six months to make this work. I had savings. I've got family helping me. Like, what does that look like? Because I think a lot of people are leaving a job, wanting to go do something new. Maybe entrepreneurship sounds good. 
talk to me, just, you know, give me the, the, the 90 second version of what's happening there and then we'll move on. Yeah. Yeah. Elevator pitch of that. Well, so what I did was we sold the house. We moved from California uh, and, and sold our house for, all, you know, a good amount of money. And then we moved over and then we put some aside for, for this transition. And we said six months, that's how long we gave, mm-hmm. we gave myself. We said six months to make this thing work. And if it doesn't work, I'll get back into that, that business. It's uh, the car business is really funny. Mm. It's the same everywhere. And I can, I can find a spot out here no matter what. So, <clears throat> So I, I love it. Taking a chance on yourself. You know, we, we talk about, okay, I made, let's just, I made a couple hundred grand, um, selling my home, put some down, uh, on a house, uh, but take a risk on yourself. I think a lot of dudes, you know, if you look in the mirror, do you believe in yourself? Uh, are you willing to take a risk on yourself? And I would argue that the number one thing you can invest in is yourself. You know, so if you're looking at big, making a big change, dude, use, use your move wisely, um, and bank that you have what it takes to go and provide for your family. And I think that can take different shapes and forms. So dude, kudos to you for banking on yourself. Yeah, no, I actually, it's funny that you said that. Cause that's one of the biggest things that I wanted to, to drive home on this podcast in particular, cause you're doing one on, on fatherhood. Your podcast is on fatherhood. And I love that because I think that one of the things that I really wanted to drive home and hopefully inspire somebody who's listening to it is that in the last five years, I've changed as a person in the way that I want mm. to um, take ch- more chances on myself and do more things. I mean, I actually, on my own podcast, I had said that I would never run a Spartan race. I said I would never do that. I know it's not the same thing as m- making a huge move. And then now I'm like addicted to these races. <laughs> mm. um, That's we're, awesome. We're shirt right now. But uh, I... So what was the shift that you had? So before it was, I wouldn't do a Spartan race and maybe I wouldn't bank on myself to go start a business. What was the shift for you? I think there was a, I don't know what the, where the epiphany came from, but I just, I felt like I was in this area of my life where I was like, I I felt like I was happy because I was really far along in my career and I had Mm. moved up to the basically the point where my next step is having my name on a build on a dealership building. That was the Mm -hmm. next, really the next step for me. And I, and I, and I think I looked back and went, I'm not happy with that. That doesn't make me happy as a, as a, as an individual, maybe it make it, maybe it looks good on paper. Like, Oh, I, I run this show at this dealership. It meant it it literally had held no, regard in my head. Like I just didn't feel complete. And then it was funny. A buddy of mine goes, Hey, let's go snowboarding. And I, and just so you know, I've only been snowboarding, um, for the last few years. And, uh, and he goes, Hey, let's go snowboarding. I go, I hate the snow. I'm from Hawaii. I don't go snow. I don't snowboard. He was just come in like, you know, don't worry about it. It's not going to be cold. That's not what happens when you're snowboarding. And, and I, and I skateboard, I've skateboarded my whole life. And he goes, you're, you're a skater. You're going to be fine. We went to Squaw Valley or sorry, Palisades now. And he took me up to, um, to the bowl, to Siberia, the Siberia bowl, mm. uh, first day. And I ate it, went down the Siberia bowl, like 40 miles an hour on my stomach. Yeah. And then I got up and I was like, I love this. Uh, and I think that was the start of me going, you know, being outdoors, seeing what, you know, God made this, you know, when you look, mm. I look out at that and I go, God made this for us. And I think the reason why I wasn't happy was I wasn't enjoying what God gave us enough. And then it was like, okay, well, I used to hunt with my uncle when I was a kid. That was so much fun. I've gotten away from them. I don't do that. I don't fish anymore. I don't camp anymore. I don't do these things that bring me a lot of joy. And I mm. think that the, all of all the last five years has really, really just completely changed me as a person. I think seven years ago, if I would have t- talked to myself now, I think that he, that that person would laugh if I told them the, the the things that I do now with my kids, because we go snowboard together, we go to the skate park together, we fish together. We, you know, they haven't hunted with me this year; will be their first year. But these are things that are, you know, I think that five years ago, I'd be ill prepared to be on this podcast with you. And I think I'm still ill prepared, but at least I can share some insight, some insight into stuff that I've, that I've, that I've changed and, and really sought after because I think I was so unhappy with myself five years ago. There was a lot of like weird stuff, man. Um, 
Like I felt so embarrassed that I would tell mm. little white lies to make certain stories sound cooler than they were because I was so insecure with myself as a, as a man. Maybe some of that was that, that my wife and I were, were parents really young and, you know, we all, ha we had a pre-saved life. Obviously you can do the math. My youngest kid is 11. We were married in 2000, in 2011, 10 years ago. So, you know, you can kind of, and so there was a lot of things that just, I was so embarrassed by that. Mm. I look back at and go, that's so silly. Cause all of that created what I am now. And I do feel like I've made the strides to where I want to go as a father and as a husband. <clears throat> Yeah. So you've chosen to embrace who you are. You're on a learning growth journey, which is what life is, right? And nobody could be on here and have all the answers. Um, I did have like an 85 year old guy on. He was pretty, he was pretty knowledgeable. He's probably where it's at, but you know, we'll be there one day. And I think, uh, I think a lot of men are passive and insecure and ha unhappy with life and they're not enjoying the things they want to. And it's trying to find that balance of, and let's just ask you this, you know, waking up one day and going, you know what, damn it, I don't do anything that I like. I'm now going out to the bar every Thursday night and Friday night, or I'm going hunting every weekend or I'm whatever it is and making it like a separate thing from your family. That's right. And I, I think, yeah, that's the problem, right? Is so what you've done is clearly you've had to go gain some, regain some skills possibly and go do some things on your own. But then it sounds like you're bringing your family along and making it where the things that you love and enjoy, you were bringing your kids along to do the same. Yeah, that's that was always the that was the plan when I had that epiphany moment, and I I couldn't mm. even put my finger on when God put that on my heart because only He could have done that. Where one day I was like, "This is this isn't great. I'm I'm working to live, and I'm and I'm my whole life is spent at work, and I and I love work. Don't get me wrong. I know that there's like a weird stigma with the car business." Um, that stigma is because of the salespeople at the, the bottommost level. When you get into management, you kind of start seeing a business for what it is. And it's actually mm -hmm. a really honest and, 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 um, good business to be in. And I, I, but it didn't matter because I was so addicted to working. <clears throat> and then I just finally threw my hands up and I don't know the exact epiphany moment, but you hit it on the head. I did. I went out and did these things and relearned some skills and gained some new skills like snowboarding. I, I went mm -hmm, snowboarding mm -hmm. for a whole season without them, but I made it into like little guy trips because my wife and kids all understand that. Like I do need that, that, um, discipleship for sure. And, and what's funny is I've always gone with, um, I've always brought a bunch of, of guys, some new Christians, some old Christians, and we all kind of, there's, there's a fair amount of discipleship that's, that goes on on the mountain. And so I, I started that way. And then now I've moved to, I do one guy trip and then the others are with my kids. And I always do one guy trip because, and Alec, you know, Alec, he's one of the guys who goes on that trip every year. And, um, and you're right. That, that is the important thing is you do want to have a sense of, confidence going into it with the kids, which is the reason why I kind mm -hmm. of was like, Hey, I'm going to go, go on these hunting trips. And I, you know, I've had some unsuccessful hunts. California is hard to hunt. So I've had some unsuccessful hunts, but this year the, it'll be the first year that the kids are going to go with me. And I made a, a deal with them. I said, we'll go fishing together. And I need you to do the entire thing, start to finish all the way to cooking it by yourself. And I'll take you guys on a, on a turkey hunt. And they all went out there mm. and they did, they, you know, we went and fished a little pond and it was a fed, it was a, a fish and wildlife fed pond. So, you know, they were catching something no matter what, but they just caught some rainbow trout, brought it back. They cleaned it, gutted it, cooked it themselves. So now I owe it to them now that now we have to go turkey hunting this year, <laughs> which is awesome. That's though. awesome though. But I love that you kind of made a stepping stone to earn it, right? Yeah. Show like, how bad do you want this? Um, how have you cultivated your kids wanting to do the things that you like to do? What's funny is I think that I, my wife hit, hit it the best. I'm a huge kid. So the things that I'm interested in, they're just already interested in. I don't know if I'm lucky in the way that my kids want to do these outdoors things. Um, because I, there hasn't been a lot of convincing having to be done. The kids are just like, Oh, dad, you're going on a hunting trip. When can we go with you? Hey, dad, you're going snowboarding. When mm. are you taking a snowboarding? So I've been very fortunate. I wish I had more insight on that. My, my kids, my kids want to do these things. Um, you know, I go to the skate park and even though one of my daughters does not skate, um, the other ones come and my oldest is like full send. We went, she wanted me to help her to teach her how to drop in. 
and she ate it. She's still injured by that, by that. And that was like a year ago. She still has like a little tenderness in her, in her wrist, but she doesn't even care. She'll just keep going. She's like, all right, I'm going to try again, scrape up. And, and so I got very lucky that I have kids who want to do these things that are excited to do these things. They all run, want to run Spartans with me now. They're like, Hey, there's these, one of them did research. They said, Hey, there's, there's a thing called a Spartan kids race. When are you going to do that? Like, so fun whenever yeah man i think it's important to include your kids especially on the things that you like to do don't always separate it you know have your time with the dudes but um but including your children is where the bonding will happen uh so kudos to you for doing that All right, i'm going to skip a couple questions and i'm going to jump down to my rebel and create question so this podcast is fatherhood field notes you're already doing it you're opening up your life's field notes with us you're moving you're changing jobs and you're you yourself way. hanging out with your, your kids Oh, right on. Thank you. Uh, But the mantra is rebel and create. So the idea is what are you rebelling against? And what do you hope to create out of that? And it could be something so small, like I'm rebelling against leaving the house at 6am so that I can create mornings with my kids to I'm rebelling against, you know, what uh, the world says a man is because I want to create X, Y, or Z. So when you hear rebel and create, what does that uh, lead you to? Um, I'm glad you asked that question because reading your book and like, and, and using that notebook, I've had a lot of time to think about it and I have a lot of answers for it, but I think the thing that most stands out for me is I want to rebel against the social norm of today's society, not, not, uh, old society, but today's society of what my kids, cause my daughters and son need to know this. My daughters need to understand what a God fearing man looks like. And mm. what a guy who's going to lead their family looks looks like. And my son needs to see what it looks like to lead his family by serving them first. So for me, I always look at it this way. There's a, there's a guy named Tim Kennedy. He's a former, he's a, or he's still in the army now, but he was a former mixed martial artist. And he, he says, and I don't know where he got this from, because I don't know if it's an original Tim Kennedy or not. He said that hard time ta- or um, hard times breed hard men, uh, hard men breed easy times, easy time breeds soft men. And Mm. that's true because what happened with the, the baby boomers and what happened like after world war two, you needed these like really strong men. And then they created children and wanted to make a safer made, wanted to make a safer life for these children. So they created softer men because they made life easier for them. And then those softer men created a soft, insecure uh, next generation. And so right. I'm trying to rebel against that to create my son to be my son's sensitive. I'm a sensitive guy. I would consider myself a sensitive guy as well. You, you have to be, you have to ha- be sensitive. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's wrong, but I, I want to rebel against them saying that being a hard man makes you a bad man. Mm-hmm. And I want to create a safe, a safe environment for my kids to understand that they're safe, but also understanding what they need to become or need to um, marry, so, so to speak. I know that it's crazy to think of my 11 and 15 year old daughter marrying, but they are going to marry one day. I'm not right. I'm mm-hmm. under no delusions that my children will uh, will not get married. And when they do, I want them to see the type of man that I'm trying to become. I'm not there yet. I won't hit that mark and I probably never hit it. I think that striving for it is the important is the important part. And I want mm-hmm. them to see that in the man that they choose to marry. And I want my son to try to strive to be that man too for his future wife and family because he's going to have to lead them and not lead them in the way that people think that hard men lead households. They don't lead households with an iron fist. A hard man mm-hmm. is going to serve his family while also having that that uh, that drive to be better and to to keep a, a um, you know a, a strong society. And I just, I think that, that the social norms of manhood are, are a little twisted in my, in my opinion. Yeah. We just swing too far, right? We swing too far to one side or another side. And, and I'm a sensitive dude. I'm a, I would consider myself a romantic, but at the same time, if, if I need to show up uh, as a protector, I'll show up as a protector. Yeah. Um, And and I think that it, yeah, I mean, it just, it doesn't have to be, be both end or I mean, it doesn't have to be either or. I think sometimes we, we want to be so black and white 
but in you know you could give the same situation and, and what you have to be as a man is in tune how do i need to show up to this moment oh yeah and sometimes i'm going to show up and i'm going to fail and i'm going to learn and go okay uh, next time now i got more wisdom for next time i find myself in this situation you know versus just being passive and letting whatever happen happen or choosing well because i'm a sensitive guy or because this is what the world says that i uh, i'm how a man should show up then i'll do that or this is what my dad always did and he ruled with an iron fist so that's what i'm always going to do yeah. you got to you got to like pay attention to what's happening and show up as you need to show up yeah. You, to, to be successful, you have to be a bit of a chameleon. And I think that that's the issue with society is they're making you choose black or white, right? Mm -hmm. It's it, they're, it's it, easier to put in a box. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and the, that pendulum, that overcorrection pendulum just never finds itself in the middle. It just swings to one side or the other too far. And I think that that's the issue with, with that is they say, Hey, think outside the box, but don't think outside our box be this way. Uh, yeah. If, if I say I'm a Christian, well, then that means all these things. If I say I am a hunter, that means all these things. And that's just not true. Mm -hmm. um, we all have, we're all unique. Um, all right. So I love what you're rebelling against. I love what you're working to create because you're thinking about legacy. You're thinking about longevity. You're thinking about, you know, beyond the life of Ikaika, right? And so oh, yeah. you realize, I realize that the decisions, the way I show up today impacts future generations, future families. So killer. So I would love to jump into a little bit of your story for the next 10 minutes or so. And maybe you could share, you know, pre-marriage, pre, -marriage, pre um, family, uh, and kind of what has gotten you to the place that you are, you are now. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in, it's a really weird thing. Cause I grew up fairly impoverished, not so bad that we could didn't have food on the table every day, but we did not grow up with extra money, with extra means. But my parents uh, were phenomenal in the sense that they always made us feel like we weren't broke all the time, even though we, mm. you know, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty. I look back and I'm like, yeah, my parents were broke and they were trying to make things work. My mom's working a couple of jobs. My dad's working a couple of jobs. So I grew up and I grew up in a, a rougher, in a rougher neighborhood. And so I kind of grew up doing stupid stuff. I mean, what do I need to boost car stereos for? But I did that. I mean, in high school, mm -hmm. we used to boost car stereos and sell them and just stupid things. I mean, really, really dumb things. And then I went off, you know, and go to college and it was like kind of the same thing. I didn't even go to, to school wanting to learn anything. It was more about, it was more about me and, and being cool. Like I said, I've had, I've had insecurities. Maybe it's cause I've one of five and there's a, I'm from a large family. There's a lot of insecurities of like, of mm. feeling like you belong or feeling like you're important. And I was, I feel like there were so many insecurities that I wasn't my, I was never myself. I was always being someone that I thought someone wanted to see. And I, mm. and that was, went through my twenties. All of that went through my twenties. And it's just recently, like I said, I could, I, I would have been ill prepared to, to have this conversation with you just five years ago, because even then I was so insecure with who I was rather than just being like, Hey man, I am a unique guy who brings a lot to the table. And all I got to do is just do what makes me happy while also including my family in it. And, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that really, so I guess pre, pre-marriage, I was a bit of a hooligan. <laughs> um, yeah. So when you think about that transition, so you're, you're high school, you're feeling impoverished, you're feeling like you're one of five, not super important. You go to college and you're still just kind of goofing off. Um, maybe some criminal activity, maybe not. Where's this shift from, you know, and, and maybe was the shift. It's like, uh, my girl's pregnant. I got to get my crap together. Um, to what? 22. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we, so our, my oldest daughter, we're, we're a bit of a blended family. My oldest daughter is my wife from her uh, previous relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, she's my daughter, my, and, and, uh, and, so when we met, she had just gotten out of her only long-term relationship and I was goofing off. And so we originally, this was not supposed to be a, it was, a. I mean, the fact that she and I are married and, and, and went through all these, went through all these ups and downs and made it out the, the other side, I would say that is miraculous because we probably should never have even worked out, but God has his own own plans. We were never supposed to be a, a thing. And then she got pregnant and I'm like, okay, well, I guess 
we're right in the thick of it now. And then, uh, and the very beginning of our, of our relationship, even before we were married was really rough. Cause I was wanting to party all the time. And I'm mm-hmm. like, Hey, I'm going to go hang out with uh, my buddy, Chris, who was like my college, my college roommate and friend. And I'm like, Hey, Chris and I are going to go hang out. And I don't come back until the next day. And she's pregnant. I went mm-hmm. and bought a motorcycle. I mean, I, I mean, it's stupid things. I went and bought a motorcycle for literally no reason <clears throat> just because I, I wanted to. And I just felt like maybe I felt like, uh, I needed to sow some wild oats or I don't know. I don't know what it was. It was stupid 20 year old stuff. And <clears throat> man, she stuck it through. <laughs> she stuck through it. And then it wasn't until destiny. Actually, it wasn't until I was really saved because, and I, I would consider myself to have always been a believer, but I was never a Christian. There, there's a difference. I mean, I always, you know, I always knew that there was a, that there was a God out there, but I just, I never gave my, my life to him. And I never confessed with my lips that who, who Christ is to me. And then Ashley just calls me on the phone one day. We're already married at this point, by the way, and I'm still not really saved. And, and it's really weird to even think about it because this was only 10, not even 10 years ago. And then she said, Hey, she goes, Hey, I was at church and I was just my, I had tears rolling down my face and I just gave my life to Christ. And I'm like, I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, I'm a Christian. I did that. And she goes, no, 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 you have never, you've never did. You've never done the, you've never actually come to the altar and, and, and done it. And I said, all right, whatever. And then I went with her and it was that literally that first service. And I went, uh, okay, yeah, I'm ready to give my life to Christ. And that was when, that's when the changing started. But I w- I hadn't, I hadn't fully, I would say that I confessed with my lips who he was and I believed all everything, but I didn't really fully give my life until maybe six years ago when I went, when I was like, am I really living the most, the most like godly life? I wasn't, I mean, I'm, you know, speech was venom and I was talking all kinds of nonsense and I wasn't, I mean, my, my wife and I don't drink. So, I mean, I'll, I'll have the occasional glass of glass of um, bourbon, but you know, my wife doesn't drink and I, I rarely do, but I mean, we were doing, I mean, I was, it, it wasn't even in that. It was just who I was. I mean, I think that that guys try to, a lot of guys, especially, uh, people around, um, our age group, like kind of that millennial, just at before millennial type of, um, uh, guys, I think we oftentimes make excuses for why we can do something, why we can check out a girl who's walking by, why we can, Mm -hmm. um, why we can talk this way as long as we don't talk this way in front of the kids, just because we don't, just because I don't cuss in front of my kids. And, and I mean, I don't think that, a, a a damn or a, or a shit is going to make or break it. Right. But that, that venom speech is like a really bad, it's just a, for me, it just opens floodgates and then it just starts flowing. And then my speech is bad. And then I'm not doing the things that I need to do as a man to continue to grow as an individual, to be the best type of father I can be. And it's like a constant battle with me because I've always had these, I've always had these insecurities you know, I've really curbed, I've curbed, I, I would say I overcorrected. I curbed those white lies by being so bluntly honest that sometimes my wife is like, Hey, now you're embarrassing me because, <laughs> and, and that overcorrection was probably not great, but I do things like a, like an addict does things. And I think it's maybe my upbringing. I had a father who, uh, who still to this day, you know, he's, he smokes and drinks and he's, he's, uh, a, he has a gambling addiction. And I've always been so afraid because I know I have that. There's an addiction. There's like a, an addictive gene. I don't know if that's even, I don't know if that's biologically accurate. I, I just feel like I'm that type of person who has that personality. I have an addictive personality. When I do anything, I do it dialed at an 11. Mm-hmm. I don't do anything halfway, nothing halfway. It actually is a, it's probably the root of my wife and I's of 90% of my wife and I's arguments. She's like, you can't even cook a steak without doing too much research into how you cook your steak. Cause I want to reverse sear sous vide or whatever. I can't mm-hmm. do anything halfway. And everyone knows that about me. Uh, my first hunting bow was a Hoyt bow. Most people would go through a di- a bear and a diamond and then move up PSE and Matthews and Hoyt. 
And I was like, nope, I'm going to do everything right the first time. I'm going to pay, spend the money one time. I'm going to do this one time. And I go, I just go balls to the wall from jump street. And I know that about my personality, which is why I don't gamble. I've played one slot machine. My wife and I joke about it. I played one slot machine in my entire life. I won a hundred bucks on the wheel of fortune and I walked away and I told my wife, I walked away a hundred dollars up on the, uh, on the casino and it'll never change. Cause I'll never do it again. <laughs> I mean, I play fantasy football and that's like a hundred bucks, but that's not, uh, <laughs> I, I almost don't count that. Um, I don't even pay attention to it, to be honest with you. So bro, so much so much in the last 10 minutes you shared about your life, your journey. And, and, and a couple things that I just want to want to jump in on is, is one kudos to you for embracing life, right? Like our language, the way that we see things, what we believe is all kind of an, a culmination of, of every step we've taken, you know? I, and, and you know, what's interesting is, as I've, I have found myself to be a very judgmental person. My word for the year is compassion. Um, you know, judgment comes from your head. Compassion comes from your heart. Um, and somebody said something to me within the last couple months that has really helped me curb the way that I initially, and I could point to like, why do I judge people? Oh, this happened when I was 12 years old. And that's why I judge people because I'm protecting myself. Like I can jump through the hoops of why I do it. But, um, what somebody said to me is if you were in their shoes, so example, if I was in Ikaika shoes and I was on a fatherhood podcast right now, I would be saying the exact same things that he's saying. Right. So if like I hear, oh, he said saved or, oh, he said this or, oh, he, it's easy for us to go, oh, well, what do you mean? Or, oh, this is how I see it. Or, oh, this is, you know, the Western church is this or whatever it is for wherever we're at. I think it's important for us to go. If I was in Ned's shoes at 38 years old, had kids when he did, had jobs when he did, was broke when he was broke, I'd probably be saying the same things Ned's saying now, which then opens it up for me to have compassion versus judgment. Right. Yeah. So I think it's important for people to go, people are where they are. And I love where you're at, dude. And I love your openness and honesty and vulnerability around it. You know, it's like, dude, this is how I grew up. This is where I was. This is where I was insecure. And this is where I'm growing from this. Um, and your dedication to God, you know, and, and I, and I love the moments too, where you're talking about, um, like these, these significant, maybe, uh, like targets on the map where it's like, I was at church this day, or I believed this, and then this happened. And this and this is like you sharing the intimate parts of your journey. And I think some of us men don't allow ourselves to experience those moments. And it's not that you're better today than you were that day. It's that you've grown, right? It doesn't mean that yeah. we were we were bad then and we're good now. No way, because in two years, we're going to be like, oh my gosh, remember what I said to Ikaika that day? Like, <laughs> What a knucklehead. But I can only say that because of the next two years of what my life is going to be. Yeah. Right. And so um, the the one question I had is on your journey, um, on your journey, your marriage. Okay. Marriage is so critical. And you're like, dude, we shouldn't even be together. And it's wild <laughs> um, that we are together. I want to ask you to what level does the struggle, right? Marriage is a struggle, but then you also bring in some other struggles of you're goofing off. She's faithful. Um, and I mean, goofing off, like being out, just having yeah, fun. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. So, and then you think about, okay, we're learning how to live together. We're learning how to be parents. We're learning, you know, now I got Ooh, a, kids. I got a four year old, right? I got a kid on my hand, you know, I'm a dad with a kid one on the way. So to what level, here's a big question. To what level does the struggle allow you to bond with this other human being? And I mean your wife. It, it did. The, actually, the, my answer to the question is that the struggles is what bonded us because we grew together and was strengthened together. I mean, it was only... You know, it was only 11 years ago that we were swiping our, our EBT card to pay for groceries mm. and then we grew yep. together. So, so dude, tell me this real quick, because I think a lot of men just check out and they choose not to go in, they go out. So how did you go in? Like, was it, I mean, you said you're, you've had venomous, you know, words, but were there times where you just like, dude, this struggle is hard and it bonded you? Like, is there any advice you'd give a dude on how to embrace the struggle instead of run away from the struggle? Yeah, the best advice that I have. So it, it's uh, our friends all say the, the Ho'ohulis are crazy because they will, no matter what is happening, 
they'll go through that together. So my encouragement to a guy who's listening to this podcast and maybe going through that similar struggle mm-hmm. and they want to distance themselves, because that's kind of the men's natural frame of thinking is we're going to distance ourselves because we need to be by ourselves to do this, is that for me, my wife is so strong, she wouldn't let me do that. She kind of just like slapped me across the face, not figuratively and not, not literally, would slap me across the face like we need to just go through this together and we went through mm. those and in the times it was so hard we look back at it and i have siblings who are going through what we were going through then and we look back at it and like man i wish i could help them but they need to go through that if yeah. we go through that together they are going to come out on the other side so much better and we're continuing to grow as a as a married couple but I'll say that those struggles made us, we always say we're the Ho'ohulis. That's our, that's like our thing. We, we talk about how, how we're just, let's just do everything. We'll do it as hard as we can. We'll do it together, but we're going to go in hard and we're going to yep. go jump all in together. Yep. And that's uh, really dude, it. That's, that's dude. We need to hear that. We got to go in. Don't distance yourself. You're like, if you need to go on a run or go like find something that like helps you, if you're triggered to go blow off some steam, do that, but then come back. Like, don't walk out the door and then don't come back. Come back and you keep doing that over and over before you know it. You've got this healthy marriage. And I'll say, like, we're kind of in a bit of a strange now, like trying to get established. And the struggle of it is really bringing us deeper intimately together, which is it's awesome if you allow the moments to do that. So, bro, my last question for you is legacy. Imagine 20 years down the road, you're peeking into the homes of your children. What is it that you see playing out in their homes? Like, what are the values? And you go, oh, those are the things that I worked for right there. What do you see? For my daughters, it's seeing that sh- that my daughters found um, men who can help lead their households the correct way by mm. by serving their family first. Seeing a man who a man who does take care of his family and do- is the protector of the family, but is also showing a, an act of service. I mean, Jesus washed washed the disciples' feet, and my son to watch him lead for lead his family the way that I hope to be able to do one day, meaning that he does the same thing that I want for my daughters, where that that's the lasting legacy that someone that I look in there and I go, that man right there is a man who's following Christ first and that he, his family is coming second and, and seeing that type of happiness coming from them, because that's, that really does is the thing that makes me the happiest is knowing that when I do it, I go, I'm doing that through Christ. Christ is coming, is, is working through me to do that and to continue to do that. So, so leaving a, 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 a God following a Christ following um, legacy is what I'm hoping for to, to see beautiful man Ikaika, thank you for opening up your field notes uh in the midst of this huge transition you're doing with your family thank you for the way that you show up for your kids uh and are training and preparing your children to one day have their own families right because my kids might marry your kids one day and so the way you and i both show up matters and that's why all of us dads are on here listening uh and and participating right this isn't just like a show up and listen but we're participating in mastering the craft of fatherhood and you are definitely doing that um Um, And just keep loving your kids, loving your wife, and then sharing that with the world and being yourself, brother. I appreciate you. I appreciate you, man. Thank you, Ned. All right, man. Until next time. Man, what another great conversation with an incredible dad. I love hearing the pausing to not just go through life, um, the manner you've always expected it would go, but that you would take a chance on yourself, take a chance on your family, take a chance on doing something different, taking your family on an adventure. A quote that I really loved that stuck with me is, you know, my son needs to see what it looks like to lead a family by serving first. Love it. Powerful. And if us dads could do that for our sons, we will just set up future success for families and generations in the future. Thank you to all you dads out there listening to Rebel and Create's Fatherhood Field Notes podcast. What you do matters. Don't be like everybody else. Be yourself. That is who your kids, spouse, and community needs. This is your guide, Ned Shout. Together, let's rebel against the view that fatherhood has little impact and create lives engaged in mastering the craft of fatherhood. I look forward to hanging out with you next time. Thank you.